Good evening and welcome to tonight's program. The Lincoln Presidential Foundation was proud to officially launch Warning Signs, Lincoln's response to rising threats to freedom, justice, and democracy this fall. This project made possible with the generous support from Iron Mountain is both history and a call to action for all citizens to be engaged in the responsibilities we each have in self-government. The project includes an array of new resources, including a companion docu-series to accommodate schedules we're reversing parts three and four, and tonight we will be preparing part four of Perpetual Struggle, followed by a discussion featuring Dr. Jonathan White. We will premiere part three later this month. My name is Phyllis Evans, and I am the Senior Director of Development for the Foundation. Before we begin our program this evening, I'd like to thank each of you for joining us and remind you that following tonight's presentation, we will entertain your questions for Dr. White. In order to streamline the process and hopefully allow us to get to even more questions to tonight's speaker, please only submit your questions for Dr. White through the Q&A function. And now the premiere of the part four of Warning Signs, Lincoln's Response to Rising Tensions in the 1850s. On his way to the presidency, Lincoln's invited to a brief reception in the capital of New Jersey, the capital of a state that only gave barely more than half of their electoral votes to Lincoln. Lincoln gives this short speech and he closes the speech by saying, hey, I know that most of you didn't vote for me. Most of you don't want me as the representative man of the country, but you are, by holding this reception, respecting the fact that under the Constitution, I am going to be the next president of the United States. And he says, I value this party and reception more than had it been held by my friends. What he was saying was, this is how you act like a good loser. For a republic to be viable, for a republic to last, for a republic to perpetuate itself, it has to produce election after election after election, good winners and good losers. Citizens eventually of 11 Southern states were unwilling to do that. They proved in my mind to be bad losers. Lincoln goes into his presidency in March of 1861, very naively believing that he can still compromise with the South. In his first inaugural address on March 4th, 1861, he pleads with white Southerners not to go to war. He makes concessions to them on the slavery issue. He says that he will not touch slavery where it already exists and that he'll in fact enforce the Fugitive Slave Act of 1850 because as the executive branch of the government, that's what the Constitution requires him to do. But it's clear in the South, they're, they're preparing for secession. Lincoln assumes office on March 4th, 1861. Citizens of seven states no longer think they're a part of America. They think they are part of this new confederation they call the Confederate States of America. Four states will join them after the firing on Fort Sumter and Lincoln calls out the militia on April 15th. Lincoln enters the presidency and immediately is immersed into a civil war where the Constitution does not have the tools to fight. And so he's constantly battling with, what should I interpret here? How should I understand this? We've never done this before. And really the whole period is like that. It's a test for, we've never done this. What are we gonna do now? And what are the guardrails? How are we going to make decisions about this? One of the biggest complaints I get from students is that, well, how come Lincoln wasn't more of an abolitionist? He never called himself an abolitionist and studiously avoided that term. Uh, he avoided it because abolitionists had the reputation somewhat earned. They were not as respectful of the United States Constitution, a constitution that made compromises with slavery. Lincoln said, we have no choice. We can't just pick the parts of the constitution that we like and obey that and pick the parts that we don't like and not obey that. The most famous abolitionist in my mind was William Lloyd Garrison, editor of The Liberator. No union with slaveholders was one of the slogans on the masthead. This is a guy in 1854 who burned a copy of the Constitution in public. You don't do that. So the abolitionists, as much as we think today, are the you know slam dunk, of course. Who's in favor of slavery? At that time, they were known as being less obedient or respectful of a Constitution that had compromises. Lincoln had many things about him that were not wonderful, that were not 
things that we should aspire to. Um, he did not have the kind of view of civil rights that we would want him to have, and that many of his fellow men had. This is the danger in finding heroes in our past, because no one lived a perfect life. No one has done everything the right way. There are people we can admire, and I deeply admire Lincoln. But he certainly was not perfect, and we should grapple with him as a human being. It's okay to say Lincoln wasn't perfect. It makes him human. That's one of the things we often forget, is that we are talking about people when we're talking about history. Too often we think of Abraham Lincoln as this larger-than-life statue in Washington, D.C., this icon who's almost untouchable. And we forget that he was a human being who lived through this tumultuous period and who made incredible arguments that helped shape the path of our nation moving forward. One of the great lessons is, what does it mean to be a self-governing people? What are the sorts of things we need to think alike about, where we can differ on policy, but what are some building blocks of democracy and republicanism and self-government that we need to all share in order to get along? And the Civil War, in fairness, was not simply a war of freedom versus slavery. It was a war between rival understandings and interpretations of the Constitution. Southerners, in particular, white Southern slaveholders, believed that the Constitution owed them, that justice meant they could take slaves into free territory. And they could look at the Dred Scott opinion as proof of that. They could look at the Fugitive Slave Act as proof of that. Northerners believed that, yeah, there was some responsibility that they had to return fugitive slaves to their legal owners, but that as a nation, we needed to remain committed to eventually eradicating slavery from the country to be truly a republic and not a slaveholding republic. I see American history, United States history, as one long civil rights movement. There wasn't a time in our past where there wasn't a gap between what we profess to believe and what we actually practice. There is some progress toward freedom that is sometimes then beaten down by those who oppose. There had been some black men who were able to vote during the revolutionary period, and many of their rights are taken away. White women in New Jersey were able to vote at the time of the revolution, and there were laws passed to make sure that would not be the case. We don't really have a democracy in the United States until after the 1960s. And so the process involved in trying to get those rights was hard fought. To understand those struggles and how hard fought they were gives an appreciation of what we have today and also an understanding of how hard it is to have democracy, that it is always a fight to keep it. As Lincoln says, whether we ever attain perfection is a question for another day, but a commitment to the Constitution and to the Declaration of Independence is a commitment to working toward freedom and equality. Thanks everyone, and thank you for joining us for tonight's screening and speaker program for Warning Signs, Lincoln's response to rising tensions in the 1850s. I'm Erin Carlson Mast. We are so appreciative of Iron Mountain for their foresight and support of this project as part of their Journey to Equal Rights initiative. And we're holding this event in the wake of an election. So it's fitting that we're talking with Dr. Jonathan White about this period in history, the 1850s, which was incredibly fraught and led up to Abraham Lincoln's election to the presidency. As another one of our scholarly experts stated in the film, quote, for a republic to be viable, it has to produce election after election after election. He also commented on good winners and good losers. And Dr. White produced a thread last night on Twitter that highlighted one of my favorite primary sources that speaks to how Lincoln was prepared to act if he lost, the so-called blind memorandum, which we'll have to discuss tonight, even if it's an 1860s document and we're focused on the 1850s. Dr. Jonathan White is Professor of American Studies at Christopher Newport University. He is author or editor of 13 books and more than 100 articles, essays, and reviews about the Civil War. His earlier book, Emancipation, the Union Army, and the Re-Election of Abraham Lincoln, was named a best book of 2014 by Civil War Monitor. 
was a finalist for both the Gilder Lehrman Lincoln Prize and the Jefferson Davis Prize, and won the Abraham Lincoln Institute's 2015 Book Prize. Midnight in America, Darkness, Sleep, and Dreams During the Civil War was named a best book of 2017 by Civil War Monitor. His 2018 book, Our Little Monitor, The Greatest Invention of the Civil War, co-authored by with Anna Gibson Holloway, was a finalist for the Indie Book Awards and honorable mention for the John Lyman Book Award. He is a distinguished lecturer for the Organization of American Historians, serves on the boards, uh, boards of directors of the Abraham Lincoln Institute and the Abraham Lincoln Association, and is the vice chair of the Lincoln Forum. He also serves on the Ford's Theater Advisory Council, the editorial board of the Pennsylvania Magazine of History and Biography, and as editor of the Lincoln Forum Bulletin. In 2019, he won the Outstanding Faculty Award of the State Council of Higher Education for Virginia, the highest award given to faculty in the Commonwealth. John's two most recent books are My Work Among the Freedmen, The Civil War and Reconstruction Letters of Harriet M. Buss, which he co-edited with his student Lydia Davis, and To Address You as My Friend, African-American Letters to Abraham Lincoln, published in 2021, and A House Built by Slaves, African-American Visitors to the Lincoln White House, which was released in February 2022, very recently. John, it's great to have you back. Thanks for having me. So part four of the series brings us to the brink of Lincoln's presidency and then speaks more broadly of his legacy and how it relates to the hard work of perpetuating a democracy. That improvement isn't linear, of course. So first, yesterday was election day and based on your scholarship, how did the elections of the 1850s um, differ from today generally? It's a great question. And it's something I talk about with my students one of the things that we have to remember is that the elections were carried out very differently back then. So today, if you either went to vote or you mailed in your ballot, your ballot was printed by a local state government or was at least ordered by the state government to be printed. And you get the ballot and it has the candidates of the different parties and you select the ones that you want or you write in. There was a, a no contest election here in Newport News yesterday, so I wrote in my daughter for school board. She didn't win, but I, I tried for her. <laughs> was she eligible? <laughs> uh, no, it's the kind of Sherman thing, you know, if nominated, I will not run. If, if elected, <laughs> I will not serve, that sort of thing, I think. Very good. Um, but so today, though, that's the way it works. You go to the polling place and a nonpartisan election official gives you the ballot representing the government, giving, giving you the ballot and you pick among the candidates. In the 19th century, the, the political parties themselves printed the ballots or newspapers would print what were essentially ballots in a column of the newspaper and you could cut it out and vote with that. The ballots were often distinctive colors. So the Republicans might have pink ballots, the Democrats might have yellow or blue ballots. I mean, it, it just varied from place to place. They would have different symbols and designs on them. And so when you would go to vote, instead of going to a nonpartisan election official, you would actually go find a representative from your political party and they would give you your party's ballot and then you would walk through the crowd with a distinctively colored ballot in your hand and then put it in the ballot box. And quite often those ballot boxes were glass bowls. So there was no secrecy in the 19th century, what we call the Australian ballot from the moment you get the ballot until you vote with it. And that can lead to violence. It can lead to intimidation. It can lead to people voting a certain way because they think their boss wants them to vote a certain way. So elections were conducted in a very different way than they are today. Mm. So Lincoln sworn into office um, in, the 18, in 1860, and as you noted in this episode we just saw, uh, he entered the presidency, you said, naively believing compromise was still possible. And so one of the things I'd like you to elaborate on is compromise with whom? Was he really talking to the states that had already seceded? Is he speaking more to the states in which slavery existed that hadn't yet seceded? Um, and how much of it was him just reminding people that he wasn't the antagonist here? I think he's trying to reach out to those northern, those upper South states that have not yet seceded, places like Virginia, Tennessee, because he wants to keep them in the Union. He wants to keep the border slave states in the Union, places like Maryland and Delaware and Kentucky and Missouri. But I also do think he thought there was a larger unionist population, even in some of the South, the states that had seceded, 
that he could appeal to. And I, I think he hoped that it, that eventually cooler heads would prevail. And if he could reach that, what we today would call a silent majority, sort of a 20th century term, you know, that there was a silent majority of unionists who just needed a little bit of time to be able to pull things back together. And so that's what I meant by the that sort of naive appeal or that there was a naivete to his appeal um, thinking there were more unionists than there were even in those deeper South states. And so when you read his first inaugural address, you see him making all sorts of different arguments to try to appeal, I think, to different demographics among the Southern, the white Southern population. So he makes some arguments that would appeal to slaveholders saying, you know, if you leave the union, is it going to be easier or harder for you to regain your fugitive slaves? I mean, that's an appeal to slaveholders, right? And that's something we might not like today, but it was an argument he made to appeal to them. He also makes some folksy arguments like a husband and wife, if they get divorced, they can separate and not see each other again, except on Facebook. No, I'm kidding. They didn't <laughs> have that back then. But, but the North and the South, if they separate, they're going to always be touching. They're always going to have that common border. And then, of course, he closes with the really eloquent argument about I'm loath to close. We must not be enemies, but friends and appealing to the shared heritage of the entire nation that we fought the American Revolution together. Those battlefields and patriot graves are in the north and the south. And let's appeal to that so that we are appealing to the better angels of our nature. And ultimately, those appeals did not work. But I, I do believe he thought there was one last bit of hope that he might be successful in, in keeping off war. Mm -hmm. um, he had already seen how compromise could be broken or distorted, as with the, you know, the earlier compromises in the 1800s, the Constitution itself being a compromise. But um, with the Compromise of 1850 and the Kansas-Nebraska Act, I'd like to talk to you about that in sure. particular. Based on your research, um, can you talk a little bit about Lincoln's responses to those and how that relates to his views on, well, let's let's back this up. Based on your research, what were the consequences of compromise on the issue of slavery at the founding and throughout the 19th century, including the 1850s? You speak a little bit to that because he's trying to comp he's trying to offer a compromise to slaveholders. Right. Even though he's anti-slavery. So is, is compromise, had compromise been good or were there other consequences to democracy? Yeah, you know, I think one of the important ones is the Compromise of 1820. That brings Missouri into the Union as a slave state. It brings Maine into the Union as a free state. So they're trying to keep balance in the Senate between free and slave states. And then it draws a line along the 3630 parallel. And it says, other than Missouri, north of this line will be free and south of this line will be slave. And that compromise was law for 34 years until 1854 when the Kansas-Nebraska Act repeals it. And the Kansas-Nebraska Act takes that free territory that had been north of the 3630 parallel and says, okay, it's no longer free. Now we're going to open it up to popular sovereignty. So the people who move there, and we should specify the white people who move there, they will vote, do we want to have slavery here or do we want this territory to be free? And Lincoln saw that as, as an incredible betrayal of a compromise that had stood for more than a generation. And from Lincoln's perspective, the founders had, yes, compromised on the question of slavery, but they had set slavery on a path of ultimate extinction. And the Compromise of 1820 essentially kept that path of ultimate extinction going by creating so much free territory in the North. And when that gets repealed by the Kansas-Nebraska Act, Lincoln, Lincoln now sees something completely different happening. No longer is slavery being hemmed in or being kept in the South. Now you could take slaves as far Northwest as what is today Idaho. I mean, that sort of territory was open up to, to slavery. And so Lincoln really believed in those earlier compromises and he saw the later ones as a betrayal. You mentioned the Compromise of 1850. You know, he didn't speak publicly on that compromise. Michael Burlingame in his biography of Lincoln has some editorials that he plausibly and I think correctly believes Lincoln was writing for the newspapers responding to it. But Lincoln didn't 
didn't say anything publicly about the compromise of 1850. It's really, it's really the 1854 Kansas Nebraska Act that brings him back into politics. But what's interesting is Lincoln does pledge to enforce the Fugitive Slave Act of 1850 as president, not because he necessarily thought it was a good law. I think he thought it was a bad law and should be changed and amended, but he was the president. It was the law of the land. It was his responsibility to execute the law. And so he, again, as a, as a an, as an olive branch to Southerners, says, I'll enforce this law, even though I think it should be amended. So how does Lincoln's response to the Kansas-Nebraska Act, for example, um, and this uh, assertion that it's just it's it's more democracy, it's popular sovereignty, right? How does that relate to his views on where power really resides within the pub republic? Yeah, you know, Stephen Douglas's view was popular sovereignty is democracy, and this is this is how it should be going. We should be letting the people of the territories govern themselves. And Lincoln responded with a couple of different arguments. One of them that I've always found so interesting, you know, the Democratic Party in the 1850s was essentially waging war on the Mormon population of Utah in the late 1850s, and the Mormons wanted to have polygamy. Now, Lincoln was by no means a supporter of polygamy, but in a very famous speech he gave in Springfield in June of 1857, he points out the hypocrisy of the democratic argument on popular sovereignty. He says, you guys claim to believe in popular sovereignty. Let the people of the territories decide how to govern themselves, and let you, and yet you won't let the Mormons in Utah have multiple wives. So like, you can't have it both ways. Either you let the territories govern themselves, or you don't. And so for Lincoln, you know, he believed popular sovereignty was just a cover to spread slavery. The other thing that Lincoln says that I think is, is really incredible in his Peoria address in 1854, he says that if African Americans are not allowed to vote in this question in, in the territories in Kansas and Nebraska, then he says it, it's not self-government, it's something more than self-government, and he calls it despotism. He says that if African Americans are men, then they, then excluding them from that is not democracy. And so uh, he he makes a number of different arguments to try to undermine the idea that Stephen Douglas and the Democrats are putting out there that, oh, we're just promoting democracy. And Lincoln Lincoln shows how they're not as forthright about it as they could be. Mm -hmm. I'm glad that you touched on that, like who the right to vote applies to at that time as well. Um, the U.S. during this period, the 1850s, is referred to by some scholars not as a republic or a democracy, but as an electoral autocracy because mm. of how limited the vote was at the time and yet how many people it applied to. Um, in, as the warning sign series notes, some Americans lost rights they had enjoyed prior to the constitution or lost rights in the 1800s, like for example, after Nat Turner's rebellion. Right. Given your writing on these topics and you spoke so eloquently in, in several of the videos as part of this series, can you share a bit of your scholarship on how African Americans failed, fared politically during the 1850s and their different political views on what was happening based on where they were in the country? Yeah, I mean, I think to understand the 1850s, we have to go back. So there, at the time of the founding, as many as 11 or 12 states permitted Black men to vote They between 1776 and 1787. They didn't have race, most of the states, the original states did not have race-based restrictions on voting. They had property-based restrictions and of course, gender-based. So other than New Jersey from the 1790s until 1807, women can vote in New Jersey, but nowhere else. So, but the, the rules in the early re Republic were if you were a poor white man who didn't own property, you couldn't vote. If you were enslaved or a poor black man, you couldn't vote. But if you were a white man with property or a black man with property, you could vote. And so, and, and there was actually a book that came out last year called The First Reconstruction that traces black political electoral participation in the North and the South. And it's incredible research just showing that black men were actually politically active in the early years of the Republic. What happens is you get to the 1820s and the 1830s and in Jacksonian America, the right to vote is expanded for white men. So you get rid of those property qualifications for white men and it's universal white manhood suffrage. So all white men who are 21 and older can vote. 
And then the right to vote for black men is taken away in most of the states. So by the time you get to the 1850s, black men can only vote in five states. And in New York, they can vote if they have a significant amount of property. So the right to vote has expanded for white men and contracted for black men. And this matters to Lincoln in, the 18, in 1857 in the wake of the Dred Scott decision, where the Dred Scott decision, Roger Tawney says that African-Americans are not citizens and have no rights that white men are bound to respect. And at the same time, though, Tawney makes the argument that things have gotten better for African-Americans between 1787 with the writing of the Constitution and 1857 with the Dred Scott decision. And Lincoln just destroys that argument, pointing out that Black men have lost the right to vote in most of the states where they had it, and that, as you mentioned, the states after the Revolution and after Nat Turner's Rebellion in 1831 have made it harder for African Americans to be freed from slavery in the Southern states, either through manumission or statewide emancipation. And a number of other things that Lincoln talks about. And if you're if the audience has never read this speech, it's a speech Lincoln gave on June 26, 1857. You can find it online. Lincoln uses an incredible metaphor. So he describes the various ways that Black people have lost their rights. And then he paints a, a picture of a Black man who is held in bondage and he's chained down in a slave jail. And they've got him locked up with chains and a hundred locks with a hundred different keys. And they lock each of the locks and then they give each of the hundred keys to a hundred different people and they spread them out and send them all over the country. And Lincoln says it is it is so hard to 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 free this man that the only way to get him free is to find those hundred people with the hundred keys and bring them back and put them in the right order and then one by one unlock the locks. And Lincoln, Lincoln explains that if you want to understand how bad things have gotten for African Americans by 1857, you have to picture this kind of man with these hundred locks on him. He's, and he says, it is grossly incorrect. Those are Lincoln's words. It is grossly incorrect to say or assume, he says, that things are better now for African Americans than they had been at the time of the founding. Absolutely incredible. Um, leading up to the 2020 elections in this country, in the midst of the COVID pandemic, there was a bit of discussion about whether and how primaries and elections could or should be carried out, because um, there was this huge crisis taking hold. And likewise, there were some contemporaries of Lincoln's who thought that maybe, you know, there was some sort of grounds for suspending or delaying elections when the country was in the midst of civil war. But he didn't really consider that, even though he thought there was a good chance he would lose. And this is a leading question, but mm -hmm. why would he make that decision? From the very beginning, Lincoln said, I'm fighting this war for democracy. In in March of, eight, or sorry, in, on July 4th, 1861, Lincoln sends a message to Congress. And to be precise, he sends it to Congress and someone else reads it. People often call it a speech, but it was a message. And in this message he calls the civil war a people's contest he says we are fighting to prove to the to ourselves and to the rest of the world that democracies can work that the people can govern themselves and so lincoln knew that in 1864 he would be completely undermining everything he was fighting for if he suspended the election and the democratic newspapers were speculating that lincoln might try to suspend the election but he never was going to do it and there are two really important pieces of evidence that I think prove conclusively that Lincoln never had any, any intention of suspending the election. The first is the blind memorandum that you mentioned earlier that I tweeted about last night, where in August of 1863, Lincoln wrote out a little note to himself, essentially saying, it's becoming quite clear I'm going to lose, and whoever beats me is going to win on terms by which he will not be able to save the union. And so Lincoln pledges himself to work with the person who beats him between election day and inauguration day to save the union because Lincoln says he will have won the election on terms that he won't be able to save it afterwards. He then folds up that piece of paper, 
and takes it to his cabinet and has them all sign it. And they don't know what they're signing, but they are essentially pledging to work with him to work with their political opponents to save the Union while they're still in power. The other piece of evidence is that it, around that same time in August of 1864, Lincoln called Frederick Douglass to come to the White House and they talked politics for a little bit. And then Lincoln turned to him and he said, Douglas, I hate slavery as much as you do and want to see it abolished altogether. And Lincoln explained that the slaves were not running away as quickly as he had hoped they would. And, and he wanted to figure out something to do to make freedom as permanent as possible before he was out of power. And so he and Douglas came up with a plan modeled after John Brown's 1859 raid on Harper's Ferry to basically send bands of scouts into the Confederacy, telling the slaves, run away now while you still have the chance, because once Lincoln's out of office, your golden opportunity will be gone. And so, you know, that's an incredible moment. Because for a couple of reasons, one, when we think about emancipation, we usually just talk about it as a military necessity for saving the Union. It's a war measure. Freeing the slaves in that way had nothing to do with winning the war. It had everything to do with spreading freedom while Lincoln was in power. And Lincoln wanted to do that because he believed he would be out of power within a few months. And so from Lincoln's perspective, you have to hold elections and as Lucas so eloquently said in, in the video, if you win, you have to be a good winner. If you lose, you have to be a good loser. And he was preparing himself to be a good loser. Fortunately, you know, spoiler alert for those who don't know what happened, things <laughs> took a turn for the better and he won. So it turned out okay, but. That's right. That's right. Um, so thank you for describing for everyone what Lincoln did with the blind memorandum, why it was even called like that. Um, and and that it does underscore that he says it will be my duty to cooperate with the president elect. Um, but that's the expectation, right? Uh, you know, we're used to the idea that the outgoing administration works on a smooth transition with the incoming administration. So why, I guess my question for you is, why would Lincoln even bother doing it? Why does it matter? That's a very good question. Um, maybe, I, I don't know that anyone knows for certain, and I, I've heard a number of different scholars offer different interpretations of, of the blind memo. It, it very well might have been to get his cabinet on board, to get them to sign off on helping, because there would have probably been some cabinet officials who might not have wanted to assist an in incoming administration as much? I, I don't know. That's speculation. It's a very interesting question, though. Unfortunately, Lincoln didn't keep a diary to, to tell us. I wish he had. And Wells, Wells is silent on that topic in his diary, I guess. I'd have to go back and check. I don't remember what, what Wells said about it. I, I don't remember either. I just know he tends to talk about that kind of stuff more yeah. than most of them. So, the decision to proceed with the elections in 1864 created a huge logistical issue for mm -hmm. voting for those in the military specifically um, and the implementation of mail-in ballots. Can you talk about that and um, and also how people reacted to that idea, how it went, how people reacted and whether people trusted it? Yeah, it's a great question. Prior to the Civil War, there had been a very small amount of absentee voting it, and it almost always, if not always, involved soldiers. During the War of 1812, Pennsylvania and New Jersey enfranchised their soldiers. New Jersey very quickly repealed their law. By the time the Civil War comes around, Pennsylvania is the only state on the books that allows absentee voting. And in the fall of 1861, there were elections, state elections in Pennsylvania, and soldiers as far away as, as Virginia voted and there was an extraordinary amount of fraud in those mail-in ballots. Well, actually, they weren't mailed in in that instance. They they went to the poll, they went to the field, and they voted. There was one regiment I remember finding where over 900 people voted from Philadelphia, even though there weren't anywhere near that number in the regiment from Philadelphia. So there, there was so much fraud in the absentee voting that in May of 1862, the Pennsylvania Supreme Court struck down soldiers voting as unconstitutional. In the fall of 1862, there were off-year elections, and the Republican Party lost a lot of ground, which is what normally happens in off-year elections, where the party controlling the White House loses ground in the off-year elections. And Lincoln and other Republicans said, well, the reason we lost 
is that the Republicans are all off fighting and the Democrats have stayed home and voted. And that's that's why we lost. And so for the next two years, many northern states, 19 northern states, pass laws that enfranchise soldiers. And some most of the states take the ballot to the field and have soldiers vote in the field and then send the returns home. A few states like New York have their soldiers mail their ballots home and get counted with the home vote. The Republicans claimed in pushing these laws were not being partisan. Soldiers are doing their patriotic duty. They, they deserve the right to vote. If anyone does, they're fighting for democracy. They should participate in it. The Democrats opposed these laws, saying there's going to be a lot of fraud and corruption and soldiers aren't going to be free to vote the way they want because remember there's no secret ballot and if their officers are of a certain party they're going to feel like they need to vote a certain way in the election itself there was a fairly significant amount of fraud in a couple of places with new york with the mail-in ballots there were democratic election commissioners state agents who went from new york down to collect votes and mail them home and they actually got caught making up names of soldiers and forging ballots. And they sent home, they essentially ballot harvested thousands of votes and sent them back to New York. You know, it, we don't know how many. There were five election commissioners or state agents from New York who did this, who got arrested, tried before military tribunals. Two were convicted. Three were lawyered up and were able to get acquitted. But I, I think the fraud probably still happened. Um, and there was intimidation in the field as well. I, that's what I talk about in my book, Emancipation, the Union Army, and the Re-election of Abraham Lincoln. There were clear moments where soldiers felt like they could not speak their mind because they knew their officers might punish them for doing so. So it was, while it was incredible that they held an election, there was violence, intimidation, and, and fraud that took place in it. Mm -hmm. Two final questions for you before we turn it over to audience questions. Um, what, based on your research, makes voting rights so essential to the history of United States democracy and yet so contentious historically? You know, one of the things I always try to convey to my students is that if they don't vote, they're trampling on the rights that have been hard won for them. And so in my classes, we talk about how voting rights have expanded and contracted at different times. You know, African-American men win the right to vote in the aftermath of the Civil War, and then that right to vote is taken away after Reconstruction and not regained until the mid-20th century. Women don't gain the right to vote until the second decade of the 20th century, and in most places. I mean, women begin winning the right to vote as early as 1869, but that's out in Wyoming. Like, there's not many female voters in Wyoming. So it was a hard-fought victory that took a very long time. And I tell my students about the iron-jawed angels who hunger struck. You know, they picketed outside of the White House during World War I, led by Alice Paul. They go, they get thrown in jail for blocking traffic, and they hunger strike. And, and I try to get my students to understand that it's just not a given that mm -hmm. citizens get to vote. And the fact that now any 18-year-old citizen, and in some jurisdictions, non-citizen can vote, you know, if you're not if you're not getting informed on the issues and paying attention and and then participating you're taking for granted what has been won for you and so it's been a contentious history as the right to vote has expanded and contracted over time um and i just i hope and we're seeing that americans are taking advantage of it i mean we're having record turnout even in off-year elections so that's an encouraging thing um, but I, I think more more people should still be engaged. And and also, I think um, it requires us to be paying attention even when it's not election season. Mm -hmm. um, I wish more people did that, too. Yes, yes, we all do. Um, separate from from voting, what's your key takeaway about um, this time period and what Lincoln did during the 1850s and how it relates to our role as citizens today and our civic responsibility? The thing that I really appreciate about Lincoln in this time period are the speeches that he was giving. Mm 
you know, politicians today tend not to write their own speeches anymore. They have 20 something, 30 something professionals who do it for them. And I think it's kind of a shame. You know, when when Lincoln was writing, Lincoln wrote the Peoria address for himself. Lincoln wrote what he was figured out for himself, what he was going to say in all these different speeches that he gave. He did the research. He went to the state library in Springfield and looked at the, you know, the the census return type information to be able to then put it into his speeches. He did the research for his Cooper Union address in February of 1860. And, and that's the thing that I really take away that I think we're lacking today is that Lincoln was making really deep, powerful, persuasive arguments. You know, I, I love the Cooper Union address. And it's a dress that has been maligned in the last year by a, a Harvard law professor as as basically an incoherent speech. And I think that that professor just doesn't understand what Lincoln is doing in that speech. But it, it, it sort of brings the 1850s to a close and also captures what I love so much about Lincoln. Lincoln breaks the speech into three parts. The first part, he makes a historical argument saying that the founders believed Congress could legislate for slavery in the territories, and he provides a heck of a lot of, of evidence to prove his point. The second part of the speech, he says to white Southerners, stop calling us names, stop calling us reptiles, stop applauding yourselves for the awful things you can say about us as your political opponents, and actually engage with us in debate. And Lincoln says to them, you know, if you if you silence us, what do you think is going to happen? Mm -hmm. There's a million Republicans in the North at that time, he says, who have a political sentiment. And if you silence us, he says, do you think we're just going to go away? No. It, if you turn people away from the ballot, they're going to have nowhere to go but violence. And this is right after John Brown. So Lincoln says to the South, if you silence anti-slavery sentiment, do you expect more John Browns or fewer? You're mm -hmm. going to get more. And so the second part of this speech, Lincoln says to Southerners, be willing to listen mm -hmm. and, and engage and debate. And then the third part of the speech, Lincoln says to Northern Republicans, believe that your arguments are winnable and make them and take the risk. You might get, he says, you might get ridiculed or thrown in jail for your ideas, but, but believe your arguments are winnable and fight for them. And so he's given them then the argument in the first part of the speech. He's then called on the political enemy to listen. And now he's encouraging his, his, um, his own followers to, to make the case and to believe that what they're saying is right. And so I just see that as such a powerful testament and so relevant to us today in a culture where we don't want to listen to people who disagree with us. We want to silence people who disagree with us. We don't make coherent, powerful, in-depth arguments. It's all sound bites. And so I, I think we're, you know, what good is a debate when each person debating gets, you have 15 seconds to respond to this. You know, what good is that? Now, I know we don't have the attention span for the Lincoln-Douglas debates. No one's going to sit there for three hours. But but I think we could do better. And I think that the as broken as the politics of the 1850s was, you know, I see some highlights, especially in Lincoln. Yeah, I'm glad that you mentioned the Cooper Union um, speech too. Our the first uh, program we had in the series with Lucas, Dr. Lucas Morrill, and Adina Barnett Miller, the high school history teacher who, as part of this project, did a lesson plan, and she focused on the Cooper Union address for her students. And she's an amazing civics teacher or history teacher, but yeah. with a huge civics education bent in West Virginia. And, and we were glad that she chose to focus on that and break down that speech with her students very similarly to how you just did, because it is such a rich speech in terms of content and lessons learned. So our first question um, is from Melvin, who wants to know how Lincoln felt if we know or would feel, sorry, how Lincoln would feel about early voting. I don't think we could know. I mean, it's just such a different would he have distinguished context. that from mail-in voting or, you know? I mean, he certainly supported the absentee voting of the 1864 election. And he he was very supportive of that. But it, it's such a different, there there are some political, issue, political issues today that, you know, I, 
on the one hand, I know Lincoln supported expansion of the suffrage in a lot of ways, but I don't know what he would have thought of something like early voting. That specifically. Um, Greg notes, other than John Quincy Adams, who won the controversial corrupt bargain election of 1824 via the House of Representatives, he said Lincoln in 1860 was elected with the lowest percentage of the popular vote, under 48% in American history. In terms of a democratic model, how much contemporary criticism was directed at his administration um, as having a very tenuous legitimacy, uh, maybe, and he says, analogous to several recent presidential elections? Yeah, you know, I don't know of much at all, other than the South saying we're out. Yeah, you know, right. so that, I that's mean, right. that's pretty They're like we don't. Yeah, we're not accepting this. Yeah. But they they didn't they didn't do that because they said, well, he only got thirty nine point nine percent of the vote. They did it because they were unhappy that a Republican was elected. The system worked. And then they said, we don't like the outcome. And the argument, of course, they made was you're taking away our expressly written constitutional rights, which was a very debatable point and Lincoln denied. Um, but no one they didn't question it in that in the way that we do today you know the better example i think would be um was it grover cleveland no i i'm blanking now later in the 19th century maybe it was cleveland who won the popular you know there's been several times where the popular vote was won and the person lost the electoral vote hayes hayes that's it yeah rutherford hayes yeah. well was it? No, because that's the contested election in 1876. That's a that's whole right. different that's issue. That's right. Yeah. I, I want to say it's Harrison, maybe. Uh, Harrison won the... Anyway, um, you know, those are the rules of the game. And if you win the Electoral College, you win, and the popular vote doesn't matter. And mm -hmm. in the 19th century, when it went the other way, and the person who won the popular vote lost the Electoral College, they conceded defeat and went home and tried again. Mm -hmm. You know, and one of the things I'll point out, um, by 1860, you still didn't have every state voting in, with a popular vote in in presidential elections. South Carolina still didn't have a popular vote in the, the state legislature, I think, chose the electors for South Carolina. So um, now they're the last holdout. And sorry, things are just always a little bit different in, in South Carolina, in South Carolina. <laughs> yes. um, but you know, you you still don't have every state with a popular vote until into the 1870s. Yeah, that's an excellent point. Um, Mary asks, why would Lincoln's cabinet sign the blind memorandum without knowing what it said? Probably because he asked them to. <laughs> I mean, I can't think of any other reason. I think it. I think if if he came in and said sign this, they were going to do it. All right. And apparently he opened it up later after the election and they all had a good laugh about it. Yeah. Um, Dr. Brown notes that he acknowledges and agrees that there was a lot of fraud and intimidation in the 1864 election. He says Lincoln wanted to be reelected, Lincoln wanted to be reelected at any and all costs. And he wants your comment on that. Yeah, Lincoln, Lincoln didn't meddle in it personally. But there, there were definitely instances where officers are using their influence to get voters to go a certain way, and even uh, soldier voters. And even, uh, you know, one of the more egregious examples I think happened in in Tennessee. So Andrew Johnson is the military governor of Tennessee. He also happens to be the Republican nominee for vice president. And the Democratic Party in 1864, as part of their platform, had called for an armistice and a negotiation with the Confederacy. And Andrew Johnson put forward and required an oath of office, or sorry, an oath to vote in Tennessee that required you to swear to oppose any armistice with the Confederacy. So to vote in Tennessee in 1864, you had to swear that you didn't support the platform of the party that was opposing the military governor who was running for vice president. Does that right. all make sense? Union party. Yeah. And a delegation of, of Democrats, I think from Tennessee, came to the White House and met with Lincoln 
and said, this is outrageous. The, you know, the candidate for vice president is basically prohibiting Democrats from voting in an entire state. And Lincoln's response was, I'm going to let Andrew Johnson run his state however he wants to. And, you know, I don't know. <laughs> that, that, that could be seen as a little problematic, but... <laughs> Yeah. So now, it didn't end up mattering. I don't think Tennessee's vote, t electoral votes ended up counting in the election of 1864 anyway, but there that was not the only test oath. And a lot there were a number of cases where the military imposed te test oaths on voters. In July of 1864, there were, um, there were state elections in Kentucky, and the military tried to arrest the Supreme Court of Kentucky judge, the Democrat who was up for election, he fled the state and they tried to elect, arrest, I think, the lieutenant governor too. I mean, there were all sorts of things going on in the election that are unseemly. Um, overall, I mean, I think even without those things, Lincoln was going to win re-election. Um, and I don't think that the fraud carried the election or the intimidation carried the election. I don't want to overstate it in that way. Um, but it it certainly affected some people's votes. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, Chris says, during our recent election, we received in the mail fake newspapers paid for by political parties that were disguised as county information. They were termed zombie papers, he believes. So they were political mailers, but they were in the form of, an, of, mm -hmm. of, a, of a newspaper. And he wants to know, was misinformation a problem leading up to Lincoln's reelection? campaign or re yeah re-election misinformation and, and maybe propaganda is, is yeah so one of the things that's really important to realize about the 1850s and 60s and that whole era really going back to the 1820s or 30s and then forward to the late 19th century is that the newspapers were all partisan so mm -hmm. if you lived in a city a small city, you would have a Republican newspaper and a Democratic newspaper, and you would subscribe to the paper of your choice. And it, it's kind of like, you know, today you watch the cable news channel that affirms the views you already have. Back then you subscribe to the newspaper that affirmed the views you already had. And so if you were reading a Republican newspaper or a Democratic newspaper, they're going to interpret the same story very differently, or they're going to put forward different facts. And if you're a Republican newspaper, you're going to accuse the Democratic newspaper of misinformation and vice versa. And the reality is 19th century newspapers love to run with salacious headlines and stories. So you were going to have a lot of misinformation all around. I, I can give an example, actually, um, that I encountered earlier today. So, And that involves Illinois. So this is fitting. I'm going to have an article coming out in the in a, an issue of um, a journal soon, and it it reproduces the letters of a army doctor who was in charge of the hospital in Quincy, Illinois. Mm. And he described I was working on this earlier today with one of my students who I edited these letters with, and the letters are all about the election of 1864. And he describes reading the Democratic newspaper in Quincy. And it it accused this army doctor of of doing some nefarious things to sort of root out who the Republican soldiers were in the army hospital. And the army doctor wrote home to his parents and said, like, the Democratic newspaper said this about me. And I don't know why they would think this, because I'm not even planning to vote, but I didn't do this. So, you know, you get you get fake stories all the time in both Republican and Democratic newspapers in that period. Well, as you pointed out, right. as you Sorry. pointed out, sometimes they're even printing the ballot and you cut the ballot out and take that right. with you. I mean, it was that direct of a line mm -hmm. sometimes. Too, yeah. So Tim Timothy asked what, where, and when did the Harvard law professor say that Lincoln's Cooper Union speech was unintelligible? Like, was so, that, I think the question is sort of, was that recent and was it, where was yeah, that? Published? Man, I didn't want to give any credence to the book, but since I've been asked, it's Noah Feldman's book, The Broken Constitution, Ah, okay. which I think is one of the worst books ever written. And I wouldn't normally say that, but it's just, it, it egregiously misunderstands and misinterprets Abraham Lincoln. And I mean, the title comes from Jefferson Davis. So that should tell you everything you need to know. 
And he has a, a long section on the Cooper Union address that I think he gets way wrong. I've written more. I reviewed the book in Civil War News. I don't know if the review is online or not. Um, but if viewers are interested in my take on the broken constitution, you can you can find my review there. Phyllis is really good about sometimes finding those things while we're talking and posting yeah. in the chat. I know they post some of their reviews online, but not all. I, I actually hope that one's online because I'd like for my take to be out there. Yeah, good. Um, Mark asks, do you think the Civil War... Do you think the Civil War, I think, would have been averted or merely delayed if Stephen Douglas had won the election in 1860? It's a, or sorry, here it is. There's a correction. Do okay. you think the Civil War would have been averted or merely delayed if Stephen Douglas had won the election in 1860? Yeah. Um, you know, it's an interesting question. I, I think it would have happened eventually. Now, if Douglas had won, I mean, here's the thing. White Southerners were not happy with Stephen Douglas. Yeah. Stephen Douglas's whole policy is, I want popular sovereignty. Let the people of the territories decide for themselves if they want slavery, vote it up or down. White Southerners don't want that. That's not enough for them. They want a federal slave code to protect slavery in the federal territories. And Douglas is not willing to go along with that. And maybe this can help answer the question. In 1860, the Democratic Party had rules that required a candidate to win a supermajority at the nominating convention to win the Democratic nomination. So when the convention first met in South Carolina in early summer of 1860, or late, sp late spring, early summer, the Stephen Douglas can win 50% of the Democratic delegates' votes, but he can't win that supermajority. And eventually, the Deep South state delegates all secede from the convention. And then they meet again a few weeks later in Baltimore. Again, Douglas can win a majority, but he can't get the supermajority. And again, the Deep South states secede. And, and they then hold their own convention and they nominate John C. Breckinridge for, for president. So Stephen Douglas does not offer white Southern slaveholders what they want. So I don't know how they would have reacted to Douglas's election. I think the upper South would have been maybe less likely to secede. I, I don't, I have my doubts that the Deep South would have seceded, but they, they quite frankly would not have been happy with Douglas. And here's the craziest irony. You know, Stephen Douglas goes out and actually campaigns for the presidency, which is not a normal thing before right. McKinley. And he runs himself ragged, and then he keeps campaigning for Union after the election and ends up dying in June of 1861. Douglas is the guy who goes out there and, and just campaigns hard. And I don't have it in front of me, but I think the only places he won were Missouri and half of New Jersey. I mean, he worked the hardest for the election and ended up coming off the worst. Yeah. So he didn't he didn't have a shot anyway. Yeah. But. Paul asks, since Lincoln was expecting to lose the election, is there any record or school of thought um, or maybe even tradition, John, about what he might have done as a former president? Example, would he have gone back to practicing law? Yeah. So let me preface my answer by saying after Sherman captures Atlanta, Lincoln becomes much more confident that he's going to win. And there were state elections in September and October of 1864 before the November election. And those were sort of seen as bellwethers of what's to come. So by October of 1864, Lincoln is absolutely confident that he's going to win re-election. But Lincoln's plan was always to return to Illinois, to go back to Springfield to practice law again. The, the story is that he said to William Herndon, leave the Lincoln and Herndon sign hanging for when I come back. And, you know, he also allegedly talked to Mary right before his assassination about wanting to go to the Holy Land. So he probably wanted to travel and see a bit of the world as well. But for a career, he was going to go back to practicing law. Mm. William um, asks you to comment on the rebranding um, so of them not being the Republican Party, but the National Union Party in the 1864 election. And was that a helpful strategy? Yeah, they rebrand as National Union Party, and that's an attempt to try to bring in a broader voter base. 
And, and they bring in Andrew Johnson, a war Democrat, as the vice presidential nominee, which, of course, they really regret after Lincoln's death. There's a, a big historical debate over this. Michael Holt, the very eminent historian from UVA, has written a, a compelling piece arguing that Lincoln was trying to establish a new broad-based party that would have roots in the South as well, that would have a broader appeal than the sectional Republican Party did. That I tend not to agree with that interpretation. I, I sort of see it as this was a a, a relabeling for an election at a time when the union was on the line. They are trying to ha reach more voters, but I, I, I think Lincoln's intentions were to be the Republican Party moving forward after the election. Great, thank you, John. There's there's one more comment from a W. Brown who said Lincoln knew he would make a fortune as a senior railroad attorney in post-Civil War America. There Maybe you have it. Robert Lincoln, right, <laughs> working for Pullman. <laughs> but, um, yep. Um, John, it is always a pleasure having you um, with us for these programs. Thank you so much um, for taking the time with us this evening and for answering all the questions that we got in. Phyllis, back over to you. All right. Yes. Thank you, John, so much for joining us tonight just for the discussion on as Lincoln grappled with the unprecedented crisis facing the Republic, his views on self-government and how he saw progress inspired by the Declaration of Independence, but was bound by the Constitution. We are also grateful for our partnership with Iron Mountain and to be able to continue sharing this project with our members and donors through online webinars this fall. Next up, we have a great program featuring Dr. Silvana Sadali on Tuesday, November 29th at 7 p.m. As noted earlier, we have reversed the order of the last two films to fit schedules, so we'll be featuring the premiere of part three of the docuseries, which explores the Lincoln-Douglas debates, Freeport Doctrine, popular sovereignty, and the House Divided speech. Please visit our website at lincolnpresidential.org and register for the next session with Dr. Sadali and the premiere of part three. As you close out tonight's webinar, you will see a short survey. Please take a moment to complete the survey as it helps us to improve our offerings to you and lets us know what you would like to see in the, the future. As always, thank you to each of you for joining us this evening, and we look forward to seeing you all later this month. Good night.